Hey everybody, we're returning to the gimmick that started it all today. We've got an XCOM 2 solo class run. We're playing as a modded class this time, the Necromancer class. I thought it'd be appropriate for Halloween. And shout out to the mod author XCOM, spelt E-K-S-COM, for making today's video possible. Now before I get into things, I would just like to give a quick plug to my Patreon. For as little as three Australian dollars a month, you can help support my work, plus get some great perks, including early access to videos like this one. So if you're interested in that, please consider checking out the Patreon. The link is in the description. And now the rules for today's run. We're playing on Commander Difficulty, we're playing on Honest Man, and we're only using the Necromancer class in combat. Yeah, I thought we'd play on Commander Difficulty for this one. It'll keep things consistent with our other solo class runs so that we can compare how these guys go versus how the other classes went. Plus, I know some of you prefer when I play on the higher difficulty, so hopefully you'll enjoy this video. I used the Starting Soldiers mod to change our barracks to consist of 12 Necromancers. Now what exactly can the Necromancers do? Well as you might expect, they're magic users being able to manipulate life and death. Their weapons are a staff for the primary that initially does 2-5 to five range damage. It also bypasses one point of armor which is very nice. And their secondary weapon is a Psyamp to use their psionic abilities, which they have quite a few of. Now they only start with one of them, but it's a pretty good one. They can raise dead humanoids as zombies. And since we have four necromancers on the first mission, that's up to four zombies we can have. In fact, we may be able to have even more once the ability goes off cooldown if we need them. So essentially what we have here is the ability to create multiple Mimic Beacons from the very beginning of the game. And they're actually even better than Mimic Beacons because they'll stick around for the whole mission and they can attack. They have a Slash attack which does 3-5 to five damage and they also have this. Yeah, they can be used as walking bombs. Now doing this means that we lose the zombie, it's basically a self-destruct attack, but often that's going to be a price worth paying. Also, once a zombie dies, it cannot be resurrected again, I just thought I'd mention that here. So needless to say, through the power of our zombie brethren, Gatekeeper is a very easy mission. And once the mission is over, I begin constructing the resistance ring. Normally I'd go for the GTS first, but given how powerful these necromancers appear to be, I'm not expecting too many casualties. So the GTS probably isn't that important right now. In terms of the soldiers I'm deploying, I'm focusing on those with high intelligence and those with high will. All their other stats are exactly the same, so we want to focus on those too, get the best soldiers that we can. Now on our first guerrilla op, we alpha strike this pod of a captain and a trooper, and once they're disposed of, we can then quickly recruit them to the team. Welcome aboard, Advent Goons. However, shortly after that, I get a bad pod activation. I move Plot Armor, he's an interesting fellow no doubt, to a location where I think he'll be out of line of sight, but it turns out I'm wrong and he gets mind controlled by a sectoid. He's the only one with the flashbang too, so this is going really well so far. However, you remember how sectoids are weak to melee attacks? Yeah, our zombies have the possibility of one-shotting them. Now we generally want to get kills with our troops rather than the zombies for XP purposes, but in a clinch like we have here, being able to send our zombies shambling to the front line to take down some Aelamows is very useful indeed. And this last pod I'm not too worried about, even though the trooper stays alive for quite a while. It's to the point where I could finish him with the zombies, but he's not that dangerous, so I'd rather wait until a necromancer can take him down. And the reason he's not dangerous is that the AI generally targets units with the worst defense. Now this is a solid strategy, as the lower a unit's defense is, the more likely you are to hit them when you attack. 
but we can manipulate this to the max. As long as our soldiers are in cover, their defense will be way higher than that of the zombies. So it's very likely the trooper will just continue targeting zombies indefinitely, leaving our actual soldiers safe and sound. So there's really no rush here. And once again, this mission is a pretty easy one. Now as if these necromancers weren't blessed enough, we get a research breakthrough to add plus one damage to our conventional weapons. This will buff our staves from two to five damage to three to six. The potentially low damage output of the necromancers is probably their biggest weakness, at least so far, and the game is immediately giving us the research we need to counter that weakness. This is really good. Also, I will mention here that our staves can't attach weapon mods, so that's another weakness there. And something else to consider is that these guys can only equip a Reaper armor. I think the idea was so that they look like they were wearing cloaks like a wizard would. They are magic users. I'm not sure how successful the execution was, but it is a cool idea all the same. However, the downside is I'm thinking things like exosuits are unfortunately going to be off limits for us in this run. All right, now time for the council mission with the Horde sit rep. Now, I know what you're probably thinking because I immediately had the same question. Can we raise the lost to zombies? And the answer is yes. Yes, we can. And even better, our lost zombies can move in to retrieve the VIP while our necromancers hang back in relative safety. Now zombies can't carry the unconscious soldier, but they're a specialist so we can't use them anyway. We're just going to leave them behind. And something else really cool is that when we detonate the zombies, they actually don't cause the lost spawner countdown to accelerate. So we can blow these guys up all day and it won't cause any further pods to appear, at least not any faster than they normally would anyway. Now it may be a bit brutal to explode this zombie right on top of the unconscious soldier, covering them with acid, but hey, they'll be too dead to care pretty soon. So everybody evacs out, and even after all the XCOM operatives and the VIP have left, we still have control over our zombies. So I'm guessing even if a necromancer perishes during the mission, any zombie they raised will remain on the field. This is stupidly powerful. I love it. So we could stay to farm XP, or we can just release control of our zombies. We can also detonate them and get rid of them that way. Now I didn't try evacing a zombie onto the Sky Ranger, as I just have a bad feeling doing so will crash my game. So I'm not going to risk it. Now for the first Haven defense, and you'll see all our soldiers are still at squatty rank. I'm guessing these guys level up slowly, which is honestly fair enough given how powerful they are. And having zombies get kills instead of our troops will be slowing this process down even further. But once again on this mission, Jake Solomon is watching over us. We begin the mission with some really useful high ground right in front of us. So let's get up there and see what's going on. Now the Hunter is our first Chosen, which I'm actually fine with. He's usually the easiest to deal with in the early game. Now he's weak to explosions, so I'm curious if our exploding zombies will be included in that. His strengths are pretty bad though. Watchful and Soul Stealer. That is disgusting. The first pod is thankfully a Captain and Trooper, and that means more zombies being added to our ranks right off the bat. And what's even better is that any civilians Advent eliminates, we can also raise as zombies. So the better Advent do in these missions and the more civilians they take out, the more difficult things can actually become for them. It gives us more zombies to use against them. And also I should note here, there's something weird going on with some of the zombies. They turn white for some reason, but it only happens sometimes, so I'm not really sure what's causing it, if it's intentional, if it's a glitch. Who knows, we'll make do. And look at this, this zombie triggers a faceless, and that's honestly fine with me. Means we can use these guys not just as mimic beacons, but as battle scanners as well. Now it's hard to reach the hunter as he keeps flying around the place with his grappling hook. So that's the bad news, but the good news is he wastes his stun grenade on the zombies. And what's even better is we can use the zombies to eat his overwatch shot, which is going to keep the rest of our soldiers safe. These zombies are proving incredibly useful. 
Now I do detonate one of the zombie bros on the hunter, but it doesn't do any extra damage. I kind of expected that given that it didn't trigger more lost either on the last mission. And a problem we do face here is that having the zombies tank hits from the hunter is restoring the hunter's HP thanks to Soul Stealer. So it takes a few turns, but we eventually finish him off. And after that mission we have our first Corporal. We can choose between Restoration, which heals one ally, one HP per turn for three turns. That honestly sounds pretty bad. We also have Poison, which, as you might expect, inflicts poison on the target. And the really cool thing about this ability is it has no cooldown. You can just keep using it again and again. And the final ability, Combustion, inflicts a small amount of damage while also setting the target on fire. This also sounds really good. I make contact with the Black Site region just in time for the next round of Guerrilla Ops, and I wanted to do this so that we can choose which dark event we want to stop. One of them is the Collectors, so we definitely don't want that one triggering. We have the Location Scout sit rep on this next outing, and that makes locating the Field Commander pretty easy. However, getting to him is another matter. We do get bogged down dealing with some of the pods, and we're actually running out of time before the commander is going to be able to evac. So Drifter and one of the zombie bros have to push on to the commander, leaving themselves a bit isolated from the rest of the team. This is not a good situation, and it's the most dangerous things have been so far in this run. But thankfully, when we do activate the commander, he very foolishly moves towards us instead of towards the evac zone. So this allows some of our other troops to get line of sight on him, and we're just able to take him down before he gets away. And once he's down, you know the drill, right? Yeah, he's a zombie now. And the zombies all appear to have the same stats regardless of what type of unit they were while they were alive. And now that we're not under any time constraints, we can leisurely destroy the other enemies and then head on home to the Avenger. Thanks to a Covert Op reward, we have our first promotion to Sergeant. Our abilities to choose are Drain Life. This shoots a target and restores half the damage done back to us as HP. It's okay, doesn't sound great. Corpse Explosion, this is the same ability the zombies have when they blow up, but the Necromancer can use it on both zombies and regular corpses, and it's not restricted to humanoids either, we can use this on aliens. So this one could be really good, currently a zombie can only use a blue move and then explode, with this ability we could double move the zombie and then have the Necromancer blow it up, so we've added a lot of range to our explosive attacks. And the third ability is Mist, which allows the Necromancer to place a unit back into concealment. Now this one could be really good too. Imagine if we have a whole squad with this ability, we could raise a bunch of zombies, place the Necromancers back into concealment, and just sit back while the zombies do all the heavy lifting. We'd be pretty safe. So there's some cool potential strategies available to us with these abilities. We'll see how we go moving forward. And perhaps the best news of all, since we have a sergeant now, we can field five troops on a mission. That means even more zombies for us. So with that in mind, we might as well hit the black site. The first pod is a viper and a purifier. We finish the viper with combustion, and then I try to use it on the purifier too, but it's immune. Now I mean it makes sense that it's immune, but I wish the game would have told me that before I just wasted an action. On the next turn we raise the purifier as a zombie, and if you thought the weird white texture was something, check this out. This zombie is invisible. Not sure why that's happened, and it makes controlling him much more challenging than it needs to be, and this seems to happen a lot with the purifiers too. The zombies are just invisible for some reason. From what I can tell they still function perfectly fine, you just can't see them as they do it. So we battle our way through some more advent goons, including the pod with the mech, and the more of them we wipe out, the more zombies that we have to raise. There's another pod at the back of the facility, and I send in this horrific looking stun lancer to take out the trooper. Now his attack does connect, and it destroys the entire wall of the building behind the trooper. The damage goes all the way back to our squad, and Salty ends up falling through the floor and taking fall damage. This was some nonsense. 
Our zombie punched this guy so hard, half the building collapsed. I'm thinking Saitama might have some competition on his hands here. And I'm pretty sure this is the first damage we've taken in the run too, and it came from our own zombie. This is just sad. But then again, what's that saying about playing with the devil's toys? So I keep Salty away from the combat until we're able to heal him. We do have a medikit, but he's isolated from the rest of the squad thanks to his fall. So that's one less soldier we've got to work with for now, but the zombies more than make up for that. Or at least they would, but there is a problem. The zombies can't use their explosion ability while they're burning. And that purifier has just set almost all of them on fire. So that's ruined our plans a little bit. And I can't even grenade the hunter because apparently we've used all our grenades. I didn't think I'd use that many during the mission, but apparently I did. So once again, it does take a few turns, but we are able to take the hunter down. And he mostly focused on the zombies, so we didn't take any further damage. Now I think this map is from a mod, and the way up to the evac zone is horrific. Basically, there's nowhere to climb at the front of the ridge, so we have to run all the way around to the back. And this means we're going to have to deal with multiple reinforcements as Bismarck desperately sprints from the vial to the evac zone. And we've got a priest using stasis to further slow us down as well. Really nice. Now the reinforcements are easy enough to deal with, they're not dangerous, they're just annoying. But eventually, we punch our way through them and everyone makes it to the evac area, we can finally be on our way. Of course, the problem with doing story missions is you run the risk of having a regular mission occur right after, and that's exactly what happens here. So we're sending out some low level troops since most of our better soldiers are tired from the black site, and we do take an injury. The problem is that now stun lancers are being deployed pretty regularly. They can ignore cover with their melee attacks. And to the stun lancer, this puts our defense much closer to that of a zombie. And so these guys are more likely to ignore the zombies and come straight for our necromancers. So it's a bit dicey, but we still pull out the victory. I'm scanning at Skirmisher HQ to try and reach some of the power coils on the Avenger as quickly as possible so that we can build the Shadow Chamber there when we're ready. Now I did realise too late that if we haven't completed the Black Sight research, which we haven't, we can't build the Shadow Chamber yet anyway. So I could have been using our time on the Strategic Layer more effectively, but it's not a big deal. And here we have some interesting covert ops to recruit both a Reaper and a Skirmisher. Now the missions themselves are unremarkable, they usually show up sooner or later if you have zero of that unit type in your barracks, which we do on this run, but both of them are offering promotions. So I really want to hit these to get some promotions earlier than we would. But there's also an op to reduce avatar progress, so I'm thinking we should do that one first. And speaking of leveling up, Bismarck has done just that from his latest covert op, now we can choose between Lightning, which is an AoE attack that stuns enemies caught in its blast. Now it sounds really good, but the trade-off is that it requires two action points to use. We also have Bone Armor, which gives three points of armor to a friendly unit. And it's usable twice per mission. And you can stack it on the same unit. So if we gave everyone on the squad this ability, we could add absurd amounts of armor onto a single unit and create an almost indestructible warrior. Especially when combined with some of the healing abilities our necromancers can get. Like the third choice here, which is called healing. And this does what it suggests, and it heals the target 4 points of HP. Now it doesn't sound too amazing on its own, but I'm thinking combined with bone armor, I do see a lot of potential here. We soon recruit Leeson and Blue to train up as necromancers. Between covert ops, will loss, and injuries, our barracks is looking a bit thin. And Blue is actually the person we spilled acid all over and then left for dead on that early lost mission. So it's pretty impressive that A, she's still alive, and B, she's still willing to work with XCOM after we really screwed her over. We complete magnetic weapons research, but there's no upgraded staff available to us, so that's a bummer. I'm wondering if it's locked behind some other type of research. And here I want to send Bismarck off on one of those promotional covert ops so that we can level him up even more, but he's tired, so we're going to have to wait. 
And in the four days it takes him to recover his will, I actually forget about the covert ops. And by the time I remember, we've had another council drop and those promotion rewards are gone, replaced with garbage, mobility and health buffs. Now, I mean, they're not really garbage, but I really wanted those promotions. It would have given us early access to some really good high level abilities, not to mention the squad size 2 upgrade. And sometimes the amount of micromanagement in War of the Chosen really annoys me, and I was extremely annoyed at myself after this. But it is what it is, so let's just move on. Time to Skulljack a Captain. And check out the power of Lightning here. It does require two actions, and the line of sight on it can be pretty garbage at times, but it's a guaranteed stun. So we take out the Lancer, raise him as a zombie, and we leave the Captain as is. This then allows us to Skulljack the Captain as our first action on the next turn, and we have all of our remaining action points to deal with the Codex. But this being a garbage sewer map, it spawns out of line of sight. And when I go looking for it, it takes up full cover in a pretty annoying position. And flanking it isn't a good idea, since there's basically no cover out there, plus I saw a couple of sectoids hanging out in that direction earlier. So if we move up to flank this thing, we may very well activate another pod. And of course we get some bad damage rolls, which leads to not one, but two Codex clones. And look how far away they are, this sucks. Now we are able to destroy one of the three, but that's negated by those two sectoids I mentioned earlier now activating. And even though our staves don't normally need to reload, they do need to reload if we get hit by a psionic bomb. Now I wasn't expecting that, so this has really caught me off guard. Now the good news is most of our abilities like combustion still work, but we can't do regular shooting attacks. Not until we reload at least. So we run out with the zombie to tank the overwatch shot, which leads to a viper and another sectoid being activated. Did I mention that this sucks? Also, codexes are immune to combustion. I learned that one the hard way too. So between combustion immunity and having to reload our staves, there's not much we can do about the codexes. And since we're in a sewer level that's full of tiny corridors, once their turn comes around, it is very easy for them to teleport and flank us while still remaining in good cover themselves. And thanks to this, Bismarck, our highest ranked and most valuable soldier, is reduced to 1 HP. Now he's thankfully alive and we can heal him, but it requires falling back quite a distance, so he's going to be out of the fight for this turn at least, not to mention the other soldier who has to heal him. There is one saving grace in that the Viper has been distracted with using Bind on our zombies, and since it's doing this, it can't poison us, so I'm actually fine with this. A couple of turns go by, and we take some injuries, but eventually we take out all of these enemies, minus one sectoid. However, there is another pod left on the map, of course, the one containing the field commander who we've been sent to neutralize. And there's only one more turn before the commander can flee, and we cannot get an even remotely useful line of sight on this guy. So when his turn comes around, he puts on his Olympic Sprint, and if he makes it to the evac zone, this one is over. Well, thankfully, he can't quite get that far. He is really close, though. So if we don't take him out this turn, we're in trouble. And here's what I mean with the line of sight on Lightning being kind of garbage. I was hoping to use it on the Commander to buy us more time. We could stun him, that way he wouldn't be able to run to the evac zone. But apparently, we cannot aim our staff over this small barrier. So, I guess the mod author has kept things in line with the vanilla game, so I can't really fault them for that. 
but it does look like we're gonna have to deal with this guy the old fashioned way. So we start hitting him with everything we have to the point that we're ignoring the sectoid and the Lancer that activated with the commander. And I've said it before, but I'll say it again here. When you've reached the point that you're having to ignore a stun Lancer, that means the situation is pretty dire. We get lucky here though, and we get some good damage rolls, and we can wipe out both the Commander and the Lancer. And I probably could have finished the Sectoid this turn by using a Zombie as well, but I wanted to save the XP for our Necromancers. I think relying on Zombies too much has resulted in our Soldiers being a bit underleveled for this part of the game. The missions are definitely becoming more difficult by this point. But either way, victory has been achieved, everyone made it out in one piece. For the next supply raid, I've made contact with the Assassin's Territory, and that means she's going to show up on this one. Her strengths are Beastmaster, Brutal, and Low Profile. Her weakness is Groundling. This is quite a dreadful list of abilities for us, so this should be fun. Now between the Advent Soldiers and the Lost, we have plenty of candidates for Zombies, but the problem is, Zombies are not able to mark crates. So we can't just sit back and have the zombies solve our problems for us. We need to be pushing to the front line with our necromancers too, so that we don't miss out on too many of the loot boxes. And I did say we need to rely on our XCOM operatives more, so that's proving true once again. And due to a combination of me moving forward too quickly to grab the crates, our staves being pretty bad against the loss due to their low aim and their potentially low damage, plus some unlucky pod placements, we get overwhelmed pretty quickly. Oh, and check this out. Spectres can use Shadow Bound on our zombies. So this Lost, which is already a mutated human to begin with, has been resurrected from the dead and then cloned by nanomachines. This is a wild run from a lore perspective. And just when things seem quite bad, they get even worse with the assassin revealing herself. And she calls in a faceless too. Oh, and here's another lost swarm on top of all that. So I figure we're not going to take out the assassin this turn regardless of what we do. So we'll focus fire on the faceless instead and try and take that thing down. Death Wish is down to a single point of HP and he's dazed. So if that faceless targets him, he is in big trouble. Now here Drifter is up to his old tricks, missing a 91% shot. Thanks a lot for that one, mate. But despite that, we are able to end the Faceless, and we're also able to poison and burn the Assassin. Now poison significantly reduces her movement, so she's a lot less dangerous. Or at least that's what I thought, until she goes for a Harbour Wave. And for some reason here, the Harbour Wave goes right through our troops and only harms a Lost on the other side of the building. I have no idea what happened here and why we weren't affected, but given in the last run she was able to daze one of our soldiers who had Solace, I'm not going to question it. I think the game owes us this one, so let's just take the win and annihilate her. Of course, annihilating her is easier said than done, and she does survive another turn, and she disappears. We get very lucky, however, and the first zombie I send to scout her location actually finds her. This makes it very easy to finish her off. And since she's the last of the advent forces, I then send all our troops on top of this shipping container. We don't have to worry about being in cover anymore, so we can just camp up here in safety until we've thinned out the Lost's numbers a little bit. And so after 50 slain enemies and 12 turns, we make it through. That one was a tough slog. We have a council mission next that's mostly uneventful, but I did equip Salty with blue screen rounds just to see if they work with their staves. And indeed they do, so that's very nice to know. However, since the Necromancers use Reaper armor, they can only carry a single item even with plated armor. So I'm going to need to be pretty discerning with what utility items that we want to use, since those slots are going to be quite limited. After that we have another council drop, which means the Covert Ops have been refreshed, and those promotion rewards are back on the menu. But Bismarck is wounded so he can't be deployed. Life is peaks and valleys, it seems. I decide we'll just send Box Dragon instead, 
Both these guys are the same rank right now, so it's fine, we're not missing out on anything. So Box Dragon gets his promotion, and let's check out our captain level abilities. We have Fireball, which launches an explosive AoE attack that also sets the targets on fire. This one sounds like it's going to be fun. Then we have Undead Link, which we can use to buff the stats of one of our zombies. So that also sounds quite useful. And the third ability is Vigor, which basically acts like the PsyOps Inspire and grants an ally an action point. I'm thinking that could combo really well with Lightning. Three action points would allow a unit to move and still use the Lightning ability in the same turn. That could be very useful. And now that we have a captain, we can go ahead and grab squad size 2. We've also finished building an infirmary and a training center by now. The training center will allow us to place more abilities on our troops. Now given our staves aren't all that good in terms of raw damage output, I think ability spam is going to be vital to this run. So the training center should be very helpful. On the next Gorilla Op, we use the previously mentioned Bone Armor strat and give our Zombie Bro 6 armor points. And while having a shambling undead tank is very cool, this mission doesn't go brilliantly. Now part of it is just the layout of the map. There's lots of skinny corridors making positioning very difficult. But the bigger problems are twofold. The first is that our zombies aren't hitting any harder than they were at the start of the game. And 3 to 5 damage was great against 4 HP troopers, but not so much now. The enemies have a lot more health at this stage. And the other issue is that we can only raise zombies from dead humanoids. And as we progress in the game, we're getting more and more non-human enemies like mutons and vipers. This means less dead advent troops, which in turn means less enemies that we can raise as zombies. So our zombies are becoming less useful, and we have less of them. I'm starting to think this challenge may not be as easy as the early game led me to believe. Now we do win the mission, but it was close. We were literally on the last turn available to hack the objective, and I still had to play pretty recklessly to manage even that. Thankfully though, we do have something that's going to help with our power curve problem. Box Dragon has now reached major level thanks to another covert op. The first ability we can choose is Eldritch Storm, and that will burn, poison, and acid burn all enemies in an AoE. So that's pretty good. We also have Army of the Dead, which allows us to raise all dead humans in the AoE as zombies. So I'm thinking this should make most lost missions from now on pretty trivial. We're going to be able to raise a great deal of zombies all at once. We also have Spirit Guide, which grants 25 aim and 50 critical chance to one of our units for two turns. This one's alright too, but it would probably be better if we had other units who weren't necromancers. A Grenadier, for example, with their high damage cannon could make excellent use of this buff. Then we have the next Retaliation mission, and Berserkers are going to be on this one. So I put Darkhawk in Concealment, and I send him to scout ahead. And of course, on the very same turn, his Concealment gets blown by this pod standing just around the corner. And it's a nasty one too. Two Mutons and a Berserker. Now there's no way we're going to be able to take these guys out this turn, so I use Bone Armor to buff Darkhawk. He's going to take some damage, and there's really nothing we can do to avoid it. And even with 3 points of armor, the enemy brings him down to a measly 2 HP. On the next turn, we can finish off the Mutons, but not the Berserker. However, we can stun it with lightning so that it can't attack. And once it's finally taken care of, we push on ahead. Now during this time, Advent has been taking out civilians like they enjoy it even more than I do. While this is bad, as if we lose too many civilians we'll lose the mission, it is good in the sense that it gives us zombies to raise. So that's exactly what I do, but I immediately regret that decision. See, this pod activates, which I honestly was expecting to happen, but I hadn't realized just how far away my squad was. I thought we'd be able to get the jump on the bad guys and finish most of them off on our turn, but we're just way too far away, and that's not going to happen. So all that we can really do is hope that Advent either target the civilians or our zombie instead of our necromancers. Advent! 
Leider schweren Schaden! Es hat eins von uns erwischt! Wow, okay then. And if that wasn't bad enough, this shield bearer who's in a pod that literally just activated gets to raise his shield immediately. I think it's because the counter-attack dark event is active, but it really annoyed me all the same. Now our poor fallen soldier's name was German guy, and I actually put him in the thumbnail of this video before this even happened in the run. I just put him there because he's really scary looking and it suited the Halloween theme, and it turns out he ends up being our first casualty of this challenge run. So that's pretty interesting. Maybe. I thought it was. Anyway, I decide this is a necromancer run and we don't need to suffer casualties. So we raise our German bro as a zombie so that he can continue fighting for the cause. The problem is though that no matter how many zombies we raise, we seem to just keep activating more and more pods, so we're just constantly outmatched by Advent. Now eventually we do win the mission, but it comes down to the wire. If Advent had taken out even a single civilian more, we would have lost. And as an aside, I don't want to leave German guy behind, so I decide to test if evacing a zombie will actually crash the game or not. And it turns out it won't. So my headcanon is that German guy survived, and he's still alive to this day. And you can't take that away from me. Soon, thanks to yet another covert op, Box Dragon is promoted to Colonel. Our next highest soldier is still a lieutenant, so this guy has become really powerful. We can choose between Soul Spear, which is kind of like Null Lance, but not as powerful. There's also Death Touch, which allows us to instantly destroy just about any organic enemy. Now, we do have to be standing right next to the enemy to use it, and it can only be used once per mission. It also doesn't work on Chosen and Rulers, so there are quite a few limitations to this ability, but it's still a ridiculously powerful one to have. And the final one we can choose is Insect Swarm. It deals 2 HP of damage per turn, plus it reduces the target's aim. And of these three, Death Touch seems to be easily the best. So with Death Touch equipped, we set out on the Psionic Gate mission. We've got two Mimic Beacons by now. It feels really good to be able to use those again. We're also sporting some Battle Scanners, in part to deal with the Burrowed Chrysalids, but also because the Assassin will be present on this one. We take down the first pod of a Trooper, Purifier, and Archon. Yeah, we've got Archons to deal with now, so that's going to be really annoying. Then we resurrect the two Advent Soldiers as Zombies. And the basic strat here is to buff the heck out of them with bone armor and give them a ridiculous amount of armor points. And Box Dragon can also use Undead Link on one of them. If you ever use this mod yourself, Undead Link actually increases the zombie's health and its armor points. So set up your bone armors first and then use Undead Link to boost that armor even higher. And we're going to send these zombies out first to trigger the burrowed chrysalids as they should take a mere 1 HP of damage from each attack. However, the plan's going to have to go on hold because the assassin is here. And I don't know if I was just being slow or if she was really fast in reaching us, but whatever the case, I didn't expect her to reveal this quickly, so it has caught me off guard. She summons in a faceless and then goes on another Olympic sprint into full cover, now eliminating the Faceless is no problem, but there's no way we're going to be able to finish the Assassin this turn. We can set her on fire though, and I think doing this disables most, if not all, of her offensive abilities. So she just runs away even further. Now we eventually catch up with her, and she uses her Blinding Grenade on the Zombies, and it actually works. So our Zombies can't be stunned by the Hunter's Grenade, but the Assassin's Grenade can affect them. It's no big deal though, as Blind isn't really that bad of an effect. It reduces your unit's sight radius by a huge amount, but as long as we can still get in close range, it doesn't actually prevent us from attacking. I don't think it even reduces our chance to hit, to be honest. So whatever, Assassin, you lose this one. So with her gone, we can send out the zombies to start scouting for chrysalids, and not only do they take barely any damage, but apparently zombies are immune to chrysalid poison too. So that's the best thing ever. 
And even as the zombie's health gets whittled down by lids, we can use our healing abilities to restore that lost HP. So this strategy is working really well. I planned this one out quite nicely if I do say so myself. And then look at this one. Our necromancers with their horrible aim land 5 out of 5 overwatch shots on these chrysalids. That's honestly the best accuracy they've had this entire campaign. I was in shock at this. Now once we take down all the active enemies, the ones underground decide to start triggering on their turn. And the problem with them doing this is that they can attack any soldier they want, so they can go for the necromancers over the zombies. And our necromancers obviously are not immune to poison. So this is really annoying. And after it happens twice, I decide I'm sick and tired of it, and we're charging headlong into the gatekeeper. We need to end this mission quickly. So here it comes, and it's time to show off the true power of the necromancer class. See, before this mission, I deliberately made a bond between Bismarck and Boxdragon. I know, it's shocking, I'm actually using bonds. But see, these two are two of our best soldiers, so bonding them makes sense. We're going to be sending them out on difficult missions together. And by doing this, Boxdragon can use both his actions to yellow dash right up to the gatekeeper. Bismarck can then lend him another action, and we can use Death Touch to... Well, to do this. How many is that now? Ugh, I'm hit. Yeah, that thing went from full health to none just like that. Now, I think this ability won't work on robotic units like sectopods, so it's not an automatic get out of jail free card, but it is an amazing tool to have. You'll also see I had previously used Bone Armor on Box Dragon to protect him from the explosion when the Gatekeeper died. This is important, we want to minimize the time our best unit is out of action for. And with the Gatekeeper gone, we can clean up the rest of the Chrysalids. I think there was only one more. Now we can move on. And things get even better at the conclusion of this mission. Box Dragon has a promotion. Yeah, our Necromancers can actually be promoted beyond Colonel level they have an extra rank in Brigadier. Now the Brigadier abilities are all pretty amazing. The first one is Teleport. It works just like it does for the Codex. In fact, the ability's description even references the Codex, I guess because the mod author forgot to change the name. Now this ability combined with Death Touch is pretty much the most OP thing ever. We can teleport next to any enemy we like as long as we've got line of sight on it, and then we can use Death Touch to one-shot it. This is awesome. The second ability is Dominate, just like the Psy operatives have. This is going to be really useful for alien enemies that we cannot resurrect as zombies. We can still add them to our ranks through mind control. And finally, Astral Projection reveals all organic enemies on the map. So with this, we shouldn't have to worry about bad pot activations anymore. Now all these abilities seem pretty great, right? Now I take Teleport as our free ability since its combo with Death Touch is just too much to resist. But I'd kind of like to have the other two abilities as well. They're all really good. So let's see how much AP they cost. Yeah, they're free. Now why on earth are these totally broken OP abilities free? Well, I think it's because the game doesn't know how to handle the AP costs because our Brigadier rank doesn't exist in the vanilla game. So with no AP value set at promotion to that level, it must just default to zero. Now, some people might say taking all three of these abilities for free is cheesing. And to those people, I say, yes, you're correct. So let's grab all three and be on our way. We used all our high level soldiers on that last outing, so we're sending mostly babies out on this next guerrilla op. The dark event will add a block of progress to the avatar project, which we desperately want to stop, so hopefully these fresh faced younglings don't get the Anakin treatment. Let's see how they do. Well things start off horribly when we load into a sewer map, and they quickly get even worse as we have a massive distance to cover before the turn timer expires. But the bad news isn't over yet, as this spectre totally ignores our Mimic Beacon and clones Leeson instead. 
I was really annoyed by this on stream, but I do remember in a previous run, I think it was the primary weapons only, that we actually had a mission get saved because a codex ignored a Mimic Beacon. So I guess I shouldn't be too mad about it, but I still kinda am. What I'm also mad about is missing a 90% shot and an 85% shot in a row. And remember, because of invisible aim bonuses, that 85% shot was actually a 95%. And these two misses mean the Spectre survives on a single point of HP, so we're not getting Leeson back this turn. Sometimes I truly hate this game. So as you would probably expect, this leaves us in a pretty horrible position on our next turn. We've got a single turn left to hack the device, and Plot Armor can get there only thanks to picking up Run and Gun as a hidden ability earlier. If he didn't have that, we would lose this mission. Now I did see a pod lurking back in that area before, and I'm afraid that once I run in with him, that pod is going to activate and he'll be toast. So I throw down the evac zone on top of the objective. This way, if he does activate that other pod when he goes in there, we can evac him out to safety. So we send him in and no pod, cool. And then blue misses an 87% shot, as far from cool as you can possibly be. Now once these enemies are finally dealt with, the mission gets much easier. We can resurrect them as zombies and simply overwhelm advent with superior numbers. Plus we've got no time limit that we have to worry about anymore. And I actually spent a really long time searching for this codex, I didn't realise that it died from the feedback damage on its psionic bomb. Yeah, we picked up feedback as a resistance order a little while ago, and it's come in quite handy here. So anyway, this one was really awful early on, but we did make a nice comeback, and we win the day. But Jake Solomon isn't done putting us through the ringer just yet. Straight after this guerrilla op, we have the base defence mission. So this is basically three missions, one right after the next. Our roster is way too depleted for this right now, but we'll give it our best shot. So we spend an eternity taking out the first couple of advent pods, and it's to the point that the reinforcements are dropping down on us before we've even finished with the current bad guys. The damage output on our necromancers is just too low, especially for high HP berserkers, of which there are multiple on this mission. And the problem with our magic boys and girls is that if we can't summon zombies quickly, Advent starts to outpace us in terms of dealing damage. We need those extra attacks and we need them fast. So it takes an eternity, but finally we've managed to mind control a chrysalid and we've raised a couple of zombies ready to go. I buff these units with bone armor and then send them in to destroy the beacon while our necromancers begin heading back to the Avenger. And the plan does work quite well, our lemmings perform their duty of taking out the beacon, keeping our necromancers nice and safe away from most of the combat. Well mostly safe that is. We do get hit with a stasis on the way back to the ship which slows us down, and I know I'm not doing it justice in this video, but this mission took ages, around 40 minutes. I haven't shown too much of it off because it wasn't that exciting, it was just a slow grind whittling Advent down while building up our undead and mind controlled forces. It was a real slog, but we've done it. And check this out, as soon as I return to the Geoscape after that mission, two of our best troops in Bismarck and Drifter return from their covert op. So really wish that could have happened 5 seconds sooner so we had them for the UFO defence. And if our roster was depleted before, it is a wasteland of despair now. Just injuries, tiredness, all over the place. So we're going to have to recruit some more noobs and train them up as necromancers. We make contact with the Warlock's territory since we need to get to the Forge mission. He has Shadow Step, Kinetic Plating, and Shogun. His weakness is Bewildered. These honestly aren't the worst abilities. Kinetic Plating can be annoying, but the rest is okay. Then we get this ambush mission, and I'm really annoyed. We had just finished a supply raid that took 50 minutes, which I haven't included in this video, but right after that, we're getting instantly hit with the worst mission type in the game. And why did that previous mission take 50 minutes, you might ask? Well, we'll get to that a bit later, but for right now, I'm just really ticked off as we head into this mission, and you'll see that it does affect the way that I'm playing. 
We try to overwatch the captain and trooper that drop in, and of course we miss one of our shots, so it's looking unlikely we're going to be able to finish both these guys off on our turn. In fact, it's looking pretty much impossible. Now I could flank the captain to hopefully do big damage on him, but moving forward like that is going to risk activating more bad guys. So instead, I lob a grenade at the trooper. Combined with the car explosion, we inflict a whopping 10 damage. Now while that is really good, this guy has 12 HP. I thought he only had 8 because I wasn't paying attention, in which case we would have finished him. But since he has 12, that's obviously not the case. So now, no matter what I do, at least one of these guys is going to survive into their turn and get to attack us. And you'll see I do try for the lightning, but I can't hit both of the enemies, so I figure the captain is more dangerous. Let's wipe him out with the grenade. I'm also thinking the explosion could bring in some more lost, which might prove a good distraction for advent. Unless the truck doesn't explode, of course. And the grenade itself isn't enough to finish this guy, so now both advent troops are alive for their turn. And I know I could have moved Lone Wolf into cover, but I figured the trooper would just flank us anyway, so it didn't matter. But now he's really exposed. And needless to say, between both these enemies, our boy goes down. So that's the second lost soldier of the run. Well, technically he is still alive and he's just in bleed out, but there's absolutely no way we're getting him to the evac zone in three turns. So for all intents and purposes, he's gone. And the lost have arrived too, so I decide we're just going to run away with Avian. And that plan goes about as well as you would expect it to, and she gets gunned down on her way to the evac zone. Now her I'm not worried about since she was very low level anyway, but losing Lone Wolf really sucks. Now I'm pretty sure that's the first time I've ever failed an ambush mission too. We're really not doing well on these ambushes in the last couple of runs. And yes, I know that I played this mission badly, but I just hate these missions so much. And it came up at a time when I was already burnt out from the previous grind of a mission, so it was the perfect storm of disaster. But whatever, it's done now. I guess we better recruit some more soldiers. Then we have a gorilla op, and check this out. We hit these spectres with lightning, but it doesn't stun them. It just makes their AI bug out, and they start running around in circles. So... Okay, that's a thing. And now the avatar progress has maxed out, so I decide it's time we hit the forge mission. Now I am worried about this one, seeing as we don't really have any effective means to deal with the sector pod. I don't think death touch will work on a purely robotic enemy. But it's either this or a facility mission, and a ruler is going to be much worse than a sector pod. So we load up the team, and off we go. Now the first pod is thankfully a captain and stun lancer. We can wipe these guys out and then raise them as zombies. We're going to need all the firepower, or if not firepower, then meat shields that we can get our hands on. Now of course attacking these guys does trigger the warlock, and the sector pod also activates here. I was hoping to hit our zombies with bone armor before this happened, but it's not to be. We'll just have to make do. But as if all that isn't exciting enough, you know who else is here? The Lost. And this is the reason that our supply raid I mentioned earlier took so long. See, the Lost World Dark event is active, which means the Lost can show up on any mission. And given our necromancers aren't very good at killing Lost, it makes every mission take forever. I mean, this stream went for almost four hours, and we completed a measly four missions. And one of them was the ambush mission. So strap yourselves in, this one is going to be a spectacle. So the strat is to keep hitting the sector pod with lightning to shut it down, while inflicting damage on the mechanical monstrosity, plus also thinning out the Lost's ranks as much as we can. And the good part about taking out Lost is that it does give us more zombies to raise. And speaking of zombies, the Warlock is jealous of our skills and he sends in some of his own. And it's rare that I'm happy to see his spectral bros show up, but this time I am. See, one of them has planted itself right next to the sector pod and gone into rupture state. This means we can blow it up and shred the sector pod at the same time. Our shredding options are really limited on this run. Even the acid blast from the zombie self-destruct doesn't actually remove any armor. 
So this spectral has really helped us out here. And while all this is happening, lightning is thankfully much more effective in shutting down the sector pod than it was with those spectres from earlier. Since sector pods have three actions, I thought it still might get one of them on its turn. Lightning suggests that it only stuns for two, but that simply isn't happening. We just keep throwing lightning at this thing and it cannot respond at all. And eventually we do destroy it, but it takes so long that more Lost have appeared. And as soon as we're done with the Lost, we're dealing with more Spectrals from the Warlock. And we just get stuck on our side of the bridge facing endless waves of mediocre enemies. They just keep coming one after the next. I'm getting flashbacks of Mass Effect 3 multiplayer, and they're not pretty. I even put Cat into concealment to scout ahead, but Lost spawn on the other side of the bridge and cut her off. And now we need to take these things out because they're one tile away from blowing her concealment. And as we're firing away at these clowns and it's taking an eternity, I decide it's time to unleash the game changer. See, Box Dragon has the Army of the Dead ability. We have used it once already on this mission to raise three zombies at once. But during the cooldown time, we've been dropping bodies faster than Google dropped Stadia, so there's a heck of a lot more than three zombies to raise by now. It's time to make Dawn of the Dead a reality for Advent. Go forth and crush my undead minions. So yeah, it's not a great time for Advent, and I've honestly lost count of how many units we're controlling right now, including the Necromancers themselves, I think it was probably at least 30 units at its peak. Now of course this gives us absolute dominance over the battlefield, which is really good, but it also makes every turn take forever. We have to move each zombie individually, and the time is racking up here. We end up swarming both sides of the main building. I'm thinking we can then flank whatever bad guys are waiting for us. There is an Andromedon lurking out there, so we don't want to take these enemies lightly, despite the fact that we are wielding a huge amount of power. And once again, we've got Spectrals to deal with. Our zombies are more than up to the task, but sadly, in taking them out, one of our zombie bros makes a hole in the wall. This causes the Warlock and the pod with the Andromedon to activate at the same time. And the worst part is most of the Necromancers are too far away to assist our zombie brethren. So here I'm faced with a choice. 
I can either sit back and let the zombies plus our one mind controlled purifier tank the hits, or I can play aggressive, really aggressive, and regular viewers will likely know which one I'm going to go with. Yeah, we can teleport Box Dragon right next to that Andromedon and one-shot it with Death Touch. This is a majestic sight to behold. Of course, it does go into second form, and it's at this point I realise I should have equipped him with some bone armour before I sent him to the front line like this. Now, the zombies can do damage on the Andromedon shell, but I don't think it's going to be enough. So I decide to try something. I have no idea if it's going to work or not, but there's only one way to find out. I activate Run and Gun on Plot Armor, and I send him into Aid Box Dragon. He's got blue screen rounds, so he should be able to wreck this thing. Now sadly, even after a yellow dash, he can't get Line of Sight. But before this mission, I've given him a bond with Salty. So Salty can give him another action, and Plot Armor can move even further. I wasn't sure if he'd still benefit from Run and Gun if we did this, but it turns out he does. So Plot Armor has just been able to spend three actions moving and he still gets to attack. This is amazing. Of course, it would be extremely anticlimactic if, after all that, Plot Armor were to miss his shot. Nah, I'm just kidding. He lands it and eradicates that oversized bubble boy. See you later. Our Brigadier is safe for now. Losing Box Dragon would have been catastrophic, so it's good we've avoided that fate. The Purifier can set the Lancer on fire, which I'm pretty sure disables its melee attack, so it's going to be a lot less dangerous, even if we can't finish it off. And on the enemy turn, all of them, including the Warlock himself, go for either Zombies or Lost, so our soldiers are perfectly safe. That's awesome. And the zombies make the Warlock especially trivial. They're immune to his psionic attacks, so we can keep our Necromancers in the rear and overwhelm him with zombie hordes. He really can't do much to defend himself here. And the best part is because he has Bewildered as a weakness and we can hit him with a massive amount of attacks, the majority of our hits are doing extra damage. So the Warlock is really outclassed here. Once all the bad guys are finally dealt with, I misclick and I randomly send our purifier running off into the wilderness. I'm not worried about it, we shouldn't need him any further, so we'll just continue on. And it actually ends up being beneficial that I put him all the way out here, as some lost spawn in right on top of the purifier. Because he's so far away from the rest of our troops, these lost pose zero threat to the rest of the team. I mean, it sucks for the Purifier, he's going to be stuck with them all on his own, but that's his problem, not ours. We push on to the evac zone, but not everyone can make it there before the reinforcements drop in. Fortunately for us, this is where our zombies come in very handy. They can eliminate two out of the three enemies, and the third we can use a lightning to keep him stunned. Then on the next turn, after an hour and a half, we can finally leave this slog of a mission. This was insane. Could be the longest mission I've ever played in this game, minus the final mission, of course. And it wasn't even hard. Having Lost World Activate gave us a huge boost and made the mission really easy, but it also made it take a really long time. So slow and steady wins the race with this one, it seems. And the good news is that the Avatar progress has been reduced. That's awesome. And as you'd probably expect, our roster is extremely depleted right now to the point that I'm only sending five soldiers out on this next council mission, as everyone else is currently indisposed. And even of the five we have, two of them are quite low level, so I am pretty worried as we head into this mission. And it is starting to become a bit of a trope on this channel, but once again, we have our concealment blown by some horribly placed civilians. You know those civilians who can see through walls? Yeah, those guys are back. And of course, we deal with these clowns the same way we always do. But the difference is, when it happens this time, I'm actually happy about it. Because downed civilians mean more zombies for us. And even if they weren't placed in some trash location where they can see through walls and blow out concealment, I was actively planning on hunting down any civilians I could in this mission. Having zombies to fill our depleted ranks and support our low-level soldiers is going to be mandatory for mission success on this one. 
And the best part is we can use our missed ability to place Drifter back into concealment and he can continue scouting the area. So we really haven't lost much with the concealment being blown. It's a net win for us by quite a big margin. And then something weird happens with the first pod. Drifter activates them with a fireball and they seem to get glitched out or something as the two advent troops just stand out in the open. Now don't get me wrong, I'm fine with this as it makes picking them off really easy but it is strange. I'm guessing maybe they couldn't move anywhere without being set on fire from the flames that were all around them and that's why they just stood there. Whatever, it works in our favor. We're gonna take advantage. And more Lost also spawn in on this one, but they're quite easy to deal with and they just give us even more zombies to raise. And despite my concerns, we actually make it through this mission really easily. So that was a pleasant surprise. Then we've got a Haven Defense. I won't go into too much detail with this one as it is quite similar to all of our other recent missions. The Lost arrive, we turn them into zombies, and we overwhelm our enemies with pure numbers. However, I did just want to show you this part. This Codex goes for a Psionic Bomb, and once again it perishes from the feedback damage. Now this has happened quite a few times on this run, and having codexes being eliminated so easily is a good thing, don't get me wrong. But the problem is, we're trying to skulljack one of these guys to advance the story, and they keep dropping dead from feedback damage before we can get anywhere close to them. So it is becoming a problem. Then we finally finish psionic research. We're really behind on the research front as I've been prioritizing shadow chamber projects. We can finally build level two staves, which is great, but we have to build each one individually and that's pretty horrible. Not to mention they're really expensive to make. One codex brain and three sectoid corpses per staff. So we build one and I give it to Drifter since he has the highest aim, but I'm thinking the majority of our barracks is gonna be stuck with level one staves until the end of the run. The cold, bitter end. But anyway, getting back to our codex problem, I head out on this UFO raid and I decide the moment we see one, we're going for the Skulljack. And Ligmac is the man I volunteered for the job. He continues cannon fodder's legacy and we're very proud of him for it. So we run in to use the Skulljack and that causes two pods to activate, not to mention the avatar appears. But we've got an ace up our sleeve for the avatar. We can use the teleportation and death touch combo to one shot it. Now while this sounds great in theory, in practice it causes us to activate a third pod, so it's actually pretty dreadful. Thankfully there's no cooldown on teleport, so once the avatar is dealt with, we can use Bismarck to give an action point to Box Dragon. He can then teleport back to safety. We really don't want to lose our Soul Brigadier, he's way too valuable. We also burn through both our Mimic Beacons as well as raising the avatar as a zombie, so we've got plenty of distractions for advent and our troops avoid taking any damage. And the hunter has also spawned in, which obviously only makes a not great situation even worse. And here, I had a voice inside me telling me to retreat. We're outnumbered, we're outmatched, and we already got what we came for, an avatar corpse. There's no reason to stay. But I decide, instead of retreating, we're going to be aggressive and go on the attack. And I don't know what to say. I guess I just got greedy. And besides, we need the XP as we still don't have enough high level troops. Now to cut a long story short, because I don't want this video being two hours like the last XCOM run, do you remember how I just said we don't want to lose our Brigadier? Well, this happens. I think the mech did just kill the captain though, so that's something. Just please don't kill our brigadier. No! Oh my god, no! We needed him! We needed him so desperately! Oh, I should have evac'd! I should have evac'd! Oh, no! No! Oh! Oh, no!
This is a devastating blow. Box Dragon was the difference maker on the battlefield. With him gone, we're now way behind Advent as far as power level goes on the tactical layer. Our next highest soldier is a major, not even a colonel, let alone a brigadier. Plus, the Lost World Dark event has finished, so no more free lost zombies for us. We're in trouble, not just in this mission, but the entire campaign. And to make matters even worse, Bismarck has panicked due to losing his bondmate, so we can't evac this turn. Without Box Dragon, he's now our best operative, so we can't just leave him behind. We're digging in for one more turn, and yes, this is the main reason I don't like bonds. We do take some further damage, but thankfully everyone survives. I've also raised Box Dragon as a zombie, so he can evac with us in body, if not in mind or spirit. And the worst part is, I was gonna evac. I was so annoyed at myself for not doing so. This was a brutal loss. So I start chasing Covert Op promotions as we need someone to fill Box Dragon's role and we need it quickly. I also recruit some more noobs. We've got the live fire training perk by now so all their trained recruits jump straight to sergeant level. So that's a really good ability to have and without it this run may very well be over. Leveling up these guys is difficult. And the next mission is another example of just how outclassed we are. Advent is deploying sector pods on regular missions now, not to mention other monstrosities like Archons and Andromedons. And without the Lost giving us zombies, we have nowhere near the firepower required to be dealing with these types of enemies. And I know I said earlier in the video that we were relying on the zombies too much, but the truth is we have to rely on them. Our necromancers alone just don't have the damage output necessary to deal with these tougher opponents. So I decide we're just going to ignore everything except the field commander, take him out and then evac. We have him down to pretty low health and I just need this final combustion to do enough damage to finish him. He only has 2 HP. And we inflict 1 HP of damage. This was very aggravating, and our combustion attack used to do 2 to 4 damage, but since we built that level 2 staff, everyone's combustion is now doing only 1 to 3 damage. So something has gone wrong there, and we actually would have been better off just keeping our original staves. So that's a really good development for us. Now the burn will finish the commander off next turn, but that means we have to keep someone behind for one more turn. And I really doubt that they'll survive. But what other choice do we have? I don't want the dark event to trigger, so we place Ligmac back into concealment, hide him as best we can, and cross our fingers. He's getting all the risky assignments lately. Of course, on Advent's turn, they make a beeline for Ligmac, reveal him straight away, and he gets mind controlled by a priest. Now, to be honest, this isn't the worst outcome. The field commander did go down, so he did stop the dark event. And mind control is better than being killed, as we at least have a chance to rescue him later this way. However, there are a lot of negatives, obviously. Not only have we lost another one of our better soldiers, but he had the third mimic beacon that we had just constructed. So now we're back down to two. And as if our troubles weren't bad enough, the avatar progress now fills again. We've completed all the story objectives, so the only way for us to reduce it and not fail the campaign is to hit an advent facility. A facility housing an alien ruler, no less. Now by this point, Drifter has thankfully become a brigadier thanks to covert ops, but just like Box Dragon before him, he's the only one. And Death Touch will not work on a ruler, so this is going to be a tough fight. Now the good part is that we have no time limit, so we can take things nice and slow. And we get some good luck with the first pod being a mech and a trooper. The trooper is a gift from Jake Solomon himself, as we can raise it as a zombie, and then we can send that thing out to find our ruler. Which it does literally the moment it gets raised. Not to mention a priest and a purifier activate too. RNG giveth, RNG taketh away. Most of the time it seems to just take away though. But more seriously, things aren't actually as bad as they seem. Only a zombie is visible to the ruler, and it gets no actions the turn that we raise it. Now that's a good thing because it means no reaction turns from the Viper King that we have to worry about, not just yet. 
Of course, it does work both ways, as our necromancers are too far away to be able to attack any of the bad guys. We can, however, buff our zombie friend with bone armor. And now if you would like to see some pure nightmare fuel, it is the season after all, allow me to show you an advent priest using holy warrior on the Viper King. And I have to be honest, that's a really smart move AI, well played. Not only that, but the AI sends the priest falling back to keep it out of the fight. This is the type of strategy I would use, I'm really impressed with the AI here. So we can chase after the priest with our zombie, and thankfully the two advent troops focus on it, leaving the Viper King to face us all on his own. I try to use lightning, and we can connect, but it doesn't seem to stun the king at all, so that's not great. We can also connect with fireball, and these attacks can hit beyond visual range, so we can do decent damage to the king without him getting to react. Not to mention Burn seems to be doing really big damage on this guy. And I think Burn shuts down some of his abilities too, as he doesn't try to freeze us, which is very unusual for him. He can still use his tongue pull though, but luckily it misses. So we keep hitting him from outside line of sight as much as we possibly can, and eventually we send him fleeing. So we will likely encounter him again, but he doesn't have too much health, so we can hopefully deal with it when it does happen. Then we can rush the advent goons and turn them into zombies as well. We're still not out of the woods just yet though, as there is a sector pod patrolling this map. So we place plot armor into concealment and send him in to plant the X4. With a name like plot armor, he has to survive, right? Well, he actually does. We plant the explosives and then we evac out, ignoring the rest of the enemies. Once again, I was worried about this mission, but it actually went very well. And the best part is, destroying that facility reduces the avatar progress by 5 pips. That's almost half the total, that's huge. And it's bought us some time, which we desperately need to level up our troops. The hunter is getting close to being able to attack the Avenger, but until we have enough powerful soldiers, we really can't go to his stronghold. Doing so would likely be a one-way trip for our troops. So here's a council mission we can hopefully use to get some XP, and the best part, the reward for beating this one is none other than our boy Ligmac. Let's bring him back. Yeah, I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. We come across these recruits, and I immediately start lobbing some grenades at them. And it's weird to be doing this for a reason other than spite. But whatever, a zombie is a zombie, and we need all the help that we can get. Now things quickly turn pretty dire though, as an Andromedon and Sectoid activate, and there's another Archon and two Vipers nearby who are probably going to patrol into us next turn. So I decide to make a really risky play. I go for the Dominate on the Andromedon with Drifter. It's only a 70% chance to work on the big bulky boy, and if it fails, we're probably all gonna die. But I don't have any other bright ideas, so here goes. Can our drifty boy make the Hail Mary play? Yes, he can. Awesome. Now this does cause the other pod to activate, but having the Andromedon on our side is worth it. Between our zombies, a mimic beacon, and our new Andromedon friend, Advent should have plenty of targets to choose from that aren't our necromancers. And it takes a couple of turns, but we make it through these enemies safe and sound. We then hug the right side of the map, and I was thinking we were going to be able to make it to the evac zone without having to engage any further A's. But this big old gatekeeper comes storming in, and he has other plans. So to deal with this thing, we use the Bone Armor, plus Teleport, plus Death Touch Strat. And this is a wicked combo for one-shotting these things while only sustaining minimal damage ourselves. Another pod does activate before we're done with this one, but they only slow us down. We make it through pretty easily, and can finally bring Ligmac, and that third Mimic Beacon that he has, back home. And while I say this mission was easy, it really came down to that 70% mind control chance. If we had failed that, this mission could have been a disaster. But it wasn't, so we're good. Then it's time for another ambush mission, my favourite. And given how badly the last one went, I'm pretty worried about this. Thankfully this time we do make both our overwatch shots, but on our turn we still can't inflict enough damage to eliminate even one of these advent clowns. 
I used bone armor on Jetstream before these guys arrived, so I charge him in close, hoping he can survive a couple of hits. He only has to tank one though, as the captain repositions rather than attacking, so that's really nice. On our turn, we can finally eliminate the captain, and we're able to raise him as a zombie. So things are looking up versus the last ambush mission, right? Well, not really. As soon as we raise this zombie, a muton activates. We just cannot cop a break on these ambush missions. Though maybe I've spoken too soon, as some lost arrive who can help take the heat off us. We fall back away from the muton and we focus on the trooper. And by sacrificing our zombie, we can take him out. And the trooper then serves as a useful zombie for the muton to aim at. And once the muton is done, we just start running. Once we're at relative safety on this balcony, we camp for a bit to let our raised dead ability come off cooldown. In theory, we can just sit here forever, eliminating Lost and then raising them as zombies. It's the most boring thing in the world, but the more zombies we have, the safer our two necromancers are going to be. And I really don't want to take any more losses on this run. So once we have four Lost zombies summoned, we start pushing forward again. Now Jetstream is eventually able to place both Red Devil and himself into concealment with his mist ability. We then use the zombies to distract the enemies while our necromancers make a beeline to the evac zone. It takes 29 turns and a good half an hour, but eventually we make it out of there. This is definitely the longest ambush mission I've ever played. This run is proving really painful. Before long, we actually complete all the story research in the game, so theoretically, we could hit the final mission right now if we wanted to. Of course, I don't want to, because A, our soldiers still aren't high level enough, and B, all three chosen are still alive and kicking. And then something really weird happens. We have some guerrilla ops, but these ones show up just a couple of in-game days after we already did a round of guerrilla ops, and there's only two missions to choose from, not three. And one of the two is blank when it comes to the dark event that will be counted. So I really have no idea what's happening here. I've never seen this before. Now, as far as the dark events go, the bending read ability, I don't really care about. We can easily burn stun lances this run, which I'm pretty sure disables their melee. So that's going to, of course, disable their bending read ability as well. Normally, Bending Reed is a really bad dark event and you do want to counter it, but on this particular run, it's not too much of a threat. Now, the other dark event is a breakthrough on the Avatar progress. So the mission with the blank dark event must be the breakthrough, right? It's the only thing it could be. Well, that's my reasoning at least, so we set out on the blank one. Hopefully, we can stop this Avatar progress breakthrough. And we've got a couple of things working in our favor by this point. We've purchased Powered Armor, which is really nice, and Plot Armor has reached Brigadier rank. We push to the objective, and I use Plot Armor to blow up this turret with a grenade. It sounds good in theory, but it activates the Viper King. I knew he was going to show up sooner or later. I'm not panicked just yet, as we've disabled the regular pod with lightning, so we're not in too much danger. We've got a whole turn of just facing off against the King. I move forward with Deathwish onto this tile that you can clearly see will not blow his concealment, but guess what happens when he runs onto that tile? Yeah, concealment gone. And this garbage causes the Viper King to get a reaction turn when he shouldn't, so Deathwish gets grabbed and he can't attack. Yeah, we're going to reload here. Why does this game lie so much? On the reload, I decide I'm not going to trigger the king with the grenade, and we'll just target the turret with our staves. Now, my rule for reloading is basically this. If I reload because of my error, like I clicked on the wrong tile or something like that, I'll play the turn pretty much the same up to the reload point. It may not be exactly the same, as I may not remember what order I did things in, but it'll more or less be the same approach. If, however, I reload because the game has given me some broken nonsense, then it's all bets are off. I'm happy to play the turn differently, using the knowledge I've gained to my advantage. And I don't feel bad about this. If the game is going to mess with me, I'll mess with it right back. But on the reload, the game is most definitely messing with me. I shoot the purifier and it blows up, taking the objective with him. So we've just failed to stop the dark event. 
Words cannot express the amount of rage I felt at this entire mission. This sucked. And as if all that wasn't enough, this time around the turret scores with a crit. A crit. Has anyone seen a turret land a crit before? Usually they can barely hit at all, let alone land a critical. XCOM is really XCOMing me on this one. Now Fireball is able to mostly shut down the Viper King, just like it did the last time we saw him, so that's really nice. And we're just hitting him with as many Fireballs as we can. The burn saps his HP every time he gets a reaction turn, so he's going down pretty quickly. And when I say quickly, I'm talking relative for a ruler. It takes almost our whole turn to finish him off, but a mean beacon can then protect us from the remaining enemies. I was afraid the turret was going to take another brigadier away from us, but plot armor's namesake protects him, and this time the turret misses. That's much more like it. And on our turn, we can easily mop up the rest of the bad guys and call it a day. And as expected, the breakthrough on the Avatar research triggers shortly thereafter. But honestly, that's the least of our troubles right now. The Hunter has become strong enough to attack the Avenger, so we're going into his stronghold to get him. We're not ready to go into his stronghold, but we're going in all the same. Before that though, let's revisit the level 2 staves for a moment. I'm able to build 3 total, but that's it. The game is telling me I need more level 1 staves in order to upgrade them to level 2, but even after I build another level 1 staff, I'm still unable to construct any more of the level 2 ones. So it looks like we're going to have a maximum of 3 decent weapons for the whole barracks. The winds just keep coming right now, don't they? However, my sarcasm aside, we do have a genuine win in that Salty has joined the ranks of the Brigadiers by now, so we have 3 of them. It's not bad, but it's still a far cry from the six that I would like to have on this mission. I was going to take three Mimic Beacons, but since the Hunter is weak to explosives, I exchange one of them for a second grenade. So I'm ready. Hopefully the team is ready. Let's do it. Now the first pod is four Advent Soldiers, and I'm going to go on a bit of a rant while our troops battle against them. See, the mod author has advised not to raise zombies on heavily scripted missions like the Chosen Strongholds, but I'm going to ignore that advice. Now, this is something I never recommend you do yourself. The author of the mod is the one who knows more about it than anyone else, and you should always take their advice. But here I'm thinking, even taking on these four Advent Soldiers, it's taking everything that we have. So how are we going to deal with bigger enemies like Andromedons if we don't have some zombies backing us up? I don't think we can. So we're going to go a little bit wild, and we are going to raise these Advent Boys as undead minions. And you will see me saving the game here, just in case doing so did cause any issues, I could go back and reload. And as far as raising issues go, this is my own speculation. I haven't spoken to the mod author at all about this, so take it with a large amount of salt. But I think the problem with zombies on these missions may occur with the elevator. If we send our troops down the elevator, the game may not know how to handle the zombies in that instance, whether we leave them behind or if we put them on the elevator with the necromancers. So my plan is to release all our zombies before we activate the elevator, and I'm confident doing this will avoid any scripting issues in the game and with the mod. So let's proceed and we'll see if I'm right. Now, before we can do that, we have to actually reach the elevator, of course, and there's a bunch of chrysalids between us and it. So just have a look here at the effect of four fireballs unleashed on the one location. Yeah, quite a bit of devastation there. And of course, now this apocalyptic hellscape is between us and the elevator. So that might be worse than the chrysalids, I'm not sure. But more seriously, it's not really a big deal. We can just wait until the flames subside. And seeing the scorched ground effects disappear is kind of creepy. Looks like something out of a horror movie. So anyway, we've made it to the elevator safe and sound, and that's what matters. So we can destroy our zombie bros, and then we proceed into the final chamber. And the game doesn't even crash or cause any glitches, so it seems like I was right. That's a bonus. 
So now that we're in the final chamber, I start by applying bone armor on everyone. I'm expecting a tough fight here and we're probably going to take some hits. Now the first enemies are a heavy mech and a stun lancer. We can easily take them both out and then we can raise the lancer as a zombie. And then it's time for the hunter. We begin with the grenade to shred and you'll see here that he's picked up the planewalker ability. Now that's always an annoying one, but combustion doesn't trigger it for some reason. So that's a bit weird, but we'll take it. I also try for a zombie attack, not remembering that the hunter is immune to melee. So not a very good play on my part there. Now we're not doing nearly enough damage to get rid of this guy and he easily survives into his turn. And he summons in a bunch of troopers and then he hits Drifter. I decide to keep focusing on the hunter and we get him down to a single point of HP. I'm thinking this is perfect. The poison or the burn that we've inflicted on him will finish him off on his turn. So I throw down the meme beacon to distract the troopers and it's here I realize that the situation is much, much worse than I anticipated. See, the hunter has Soul Stealer. This means he gets HP back when our units take damage. And Soul Stealer does activate when the Mimic Beacon comes under fire. Now, whether this was an oversight from the devs or an intentional design decision, the end result is the same. The hunter recovers a massive amount of health and our poison and burn aren't going to do nearly enough to eliminate him. So I focus fire on him again, and there's kind of a cool strat here. By using his bond action and the vigor ability, Rich can actually give Drifter two extra actions in one turn. This allows Drifter a second time around at teleporting to flank the hunter and shooting at him. So with that, the hunter is thankfully gone, but we've still got all his troops to deal with. Now we can distract most of them with the second Mimic Beacon, but they are able to finish the zombie. And a heavy mech has appeared too. This is not looking good. Now the mech is on Overwatch, and I wasn't sure if teleporting would trigger the Overwatch or not, so I test it out, and it turns out it doesn't. So that's really good to know going forward. And once we've taken down the mech, I actually mind control some of the troopers. I know they're not the best unit, but they can shoot at the sarcophagus, which will be a big help given the low minimum damage of our staves. And they can also carry grenades, which will be very useful in exploiting the hunter's weakness to explosions. Now a codex and a chrysalid spawn in, which is honestly pretty horrible. And for some reason, I thought we had eliminated the codex, but one of the clones was left with one HP. So it psionic bombs us right as the hunter comes back for round two. And I don't mean he's come back because the sarcophagus has been destroyed. He's back because his health has fully regenerated. So we're going to have to fight this guy at least three times. And we can't really do much to him right now because so many of our staves have been jammed and we have to reload. Combustion works even if the staff needs to be reloaded, but fireball and lightning do not. And so he survives long enough to summon another four troopers. Things are spiraling downward really quickly here. Now, thanks to some prompting from Twitch chat, I decide we need to focus on the troopers first. Partly because they're restoring the hunter's health by a ridiculous amount each turn, even if they're just attacking zombies or mind-controlled units. And also because if we leave them alive, we have to attack them at the expense of the sarcophagus, and the hunter will just return fully replenished. So taking out these guys has to be the priority, and then we'll just take the hit from the hunter. So with these guys taken out, you can see the hunter restores a lot less of his health with only his single attack giving him HP back. Now he does inflict bleed on plot armor, and that's really bad. I was hoping the heal ability would remove the bleed status, but it doesn't. It has bought us some time before plot armor bleeds out though, so that's something. And we still have a single use medikit, so we can use that on him when we get the chance. But right now, we need to focus on the hunter. And so we begin yet another offensive against him. And I have to say, we're very lucky most of the Necromancer's abilities work on cooldowns. If Lightning and Fireball were limited use abilities like Dominate, we would be in major trouble. But as it stands, we can just keep hitting this guy again and again. And once more, we get him down to a single point of HP, but this time, because he has no troopers to heal his health, the burn damage is able to finish him off. 
and I could have actually fired on him with another trooper and potentially eliminated him on our turn, but if we let the burn get him, no reinforcements will drop in this turn. That means we've got the chamber all to ourselves and we can focus on the sarcophagus. Now despite that, we still cannot destroy it. It just hangs on with a little bit of health left. We do still have some uses of death touch though, so let's use that on the reinforcements. I was curious to see if this ability would bypass the priest's sustain, but it doesn't, so that's kind of a bummer. And I'm not entirely sure why I didn't use death touch on the codex. I guess I figured we didn't need it here, so saving it for later was a better play. Even if it takes a few actions to down the codex, we should have plenty of attacks left to destroy the sarcophagus. So after over one hour of mission time, we can finally summon the hunter for the final showdown. He only has half health this time, so let's get him. Now it takes a few attacks before he teleports into range of this trooper, who can shred with the final grenade at our disposal. And honestly, the necromancers seem to be as over this as I am by now, as they are rolling some good damage. And finally, Salty takes this big blue nightmare down once and for all with a combustion. Now that was a marathon. Now we have taken a few injuries, but our recovery time is quite low, so that's fine. And of course, the best part being everyone made it out alive. And after this mission, we get a research breakthrough for plus one damage to our mag weapons. So this will benefit our level two staves, even if we don't have that many of them. It's still a nice bonus to have. We get hit with yet another ambush mission, and that makes three for this campaign. This is really cringe. Now Drifter has teleport, so he can literally just fly through the level. And Rich has mist, so we can put him in concealment to hopefully avoid the bad guys. We do activate a codex early on, and I spend the rest of the mission terrified it's going to teleport on top of us and cause some carnage. But thankfully, and surprisingly, that doesn't happen. Now right as we're near the evac zone, Rich does lose his concealment, and it's just as we've got an Andromedon to deal with. Now I've mind controlled the trooper and I've raised a zombie to keep Advent's attention off our Necromancer boys. And the plan works perfectly as the Andromedon only tries for a punch on our zombie bro. This allows our Necromancers to make it out safe and sound. Now this mission didn't take quite as long as the last ambush, but it still took longer than I would have liked. I mean, I would have liked it to take exactly zero seconds, but you know what I mean. This one was another long-winded mission and we're having way too many of those on this run. However, we've got bigger problems on the horizon as the assassin has also leveled up enough to launch an Avenger assault. So heading into this one, I decide to spend a bunch of AP on giving Drifter the rapid fire ability. It would have come in incredibly useful against the hunter and I did regret not getting it earlier. So hopefully it'll come in useful here. Now truth be told, I'm less worried about this mission than the Hunter. The Assassin is usually the worst of the three to deal with in the late game, but we need to remember the Hunter had Soul Stealer, Plane Walker, and Melee Immunity. Now that's almost the worst possible combination of strengths we could have faced. Plus we have a fourth Brigadier in Bismarck this time, so I'm thinking this Stronghold is going to be easier to conquer than the last one. The first pod is once again a bunch of advent lads, which is as perfect as ever for us. And Drifter's combo of teleport and rapid fire really is quite a beautiful thing. I cannot wait to try this on the assassin. So we take these guys down, and then we've got four zombies to help us out for the rest of this area. And we then have a pod of three mutons and a spectre. Now normally this would be tough to deal with, but they're in the room that has platforms either side, and with four teleporting brigadiers, we can grab the high ground on either side of the pod and just flank them into oblivion. And to be honest, there's really not too much to say about this first section. It's not too bad at all, an easy win for us. So let's check out the assassin's chamber instead. We repeat the strat of giving everyone bone armor, then Drifter has a 70% chance to mind control the Archon that's in here. Now he saved us once before with a 70% dominate, can he do it again? Yes he can, he's really coming in clutch with the mind controls this run. We finish off the trooper, but I actually forget to raise him as a zombie before triggering the assassin, so that was a really bad move on my part. 
And then here's that teleport plus rapid fire combo on the assassin. It's just as awesome as I thought it would be. And as you'd probably expect by now, our low damage output prevents us from destroying the assassin this turn, so she's able to summon in two berserkers, and then she blasts Drifter right in the face with her shotgun. She's not normally that aggressive. I expected her to relocate on her turn, but she's having none of that it seems. Now the berserkers are easy enough to dispose of with death touch, and Rich finishes off the assassin with a big crit. And this is one of the few times I actually didn't want a crit. I was hoping he'd leave her on a small amount of HP, and then the acid and the burn that we've inflicted on her would eliminate her on her turn. Now sadly that's not to be. And because she fell on our turn, that means that we've got enemy reinforcements to deal with. A chrysalid and a mech. I decide to ignore them for now, and we're just going to focus on the sarcophagus. We can easily distract these enemies with a mean beacon, so they're not particularly threatening. And the giving extra actions with bonds strat that we used in the secondaries only run comes in very helpful here too. Giving our soldiers multiple shots allows us to whittle down that sarcophagus faster, despite the potentially low damage from our staves. Now soon enough the assassin returns with 75% HP, and I do use astral projection here, but it doesn't actually reveal her. So that really sucks. Now luckily we can easily locate her with our mind controlled chrysalid. Less lucky is the fact that it misses with its melee attack. Now here's a maneuver that I thought was pretty cool. I throw a mean beacon to draw in the bad guys and then I aim blazing pinions right over the beacon. This way the enemies will run right into the blast zone and take big damage on their turn. And then when it's our turn again, we hit the assassin with everything we have and were finally able to take her down for good. This was definitely easier than the Hunter's Stronghold. And in fact, that one went so well, I think we might as well go get the Warlock now, and oh my god, what is that? I haven't seen that bug before, but whatever, let's just move on. And it's here I realised that if I unequip some of my base level staves and equip a different base level staff, this for some reason allows me to build another level 2 staff. So that makes no sense, but okay. Now it doesn't actually help us much at this point anyway, since I've already wasted all their sectoid corpses on all those level 1 staves that I built. So now, even though I've figured out this weird workaround to get us level 2 staves, we can't actually build any because we don't have the resources. So this is really annoying. Let's just go get the Warlock. And once again, we can eliminate some Advent Clowns in the first pod and bring them back as zombies. Then we push on with Rich and Concealment, and I literally move just one tile too far and his Concealment gets blown. This leads to two pods activating on us, and they're pretty scary ones too. We've got an Andromedon, three Archons, a Codex, a Heavy Mech, a Shield Bearer, and a Purifier. So we're forced to use a Dominate and one of our three Mimic Beacons. I would have liked to save these for the final chamber, but nothing to be done about it now. And I choose to Dominate the Purifier because the success chance is 100%. I think in this situation, it's better to guarantee control of a weak enemy rather than risk wasting a turn trying to control a more powerful one. But despite all of that, the biggest thing that really saves our bacon here is Lightning. Being able to shut down entire groups of enemies is so helpful. And despite how bad this situation may have looked initially, we actually get through with none of our necromancers being damaged. Now that's most definitely a surprise to me. A welcome one, don't get me wrong, but a surprise all the same. Now the first enemies in the Warlock's Chamber are a Snack and a Spectre. We destroy the Spectre and we dominate the Viper. And the only really difficult thing about the Warlock is his four points of armor. We don't have much shredding capability, so we're not doing a tremendous amount of damage to him with our attacks. However, the weird thing is that the fight actually gets easier as it goes on. Like he brings in these stun lances, but we just mind control them. So he's essentially bringing in reinforcements for us instead of himself. Now his spectral lances are a bit more annoying, but they're just that, they're annoying. We're not really in any danger from them. And honestly, I don't know what else to say here. The battle wasn't that difficult, so how about we just celebrate Scarlet Man's demise with a music montage?
Okay, all the Chosen are gone. Now we're really just waiting on two things before we finish the campaign. We need some more Brigadiers, so we've got to get some more XP. And we need another Gatekeeper wreck. We've actually only obtained one in this entire campaign. And we need a second in order to build level 3 Psy Amps. Now before we can worry about any of that, the Avatar progress is full again. Thankfully though, we have a facility that isn't housing an alien ruler, so that's the one that we're going to go after. Now I've had to send low level soldiers on this one, as once again our high level troops are too fatigued. My plan is to avoid as many bad guys as we can, plant the X4, and then get the heck out of there. The game, however, has other plans, as we get thrown a gatekeeper and a sector pod. I didn't even know both of these things could spawn on the same mission, minus the final mission of course. But apparently they can, so the more you know. Now this is a complete disaster. There's no way in the world these troops are going to be able to deal with the onslaught that we're facing. So I follow some practical, if somewhat heartless advice from the Twitch chat. We're sending in Artorius to plant the X4 while everyone else evacs out. He's the lowest level soldier we have, so if we do lose him, it's not going to be too big of an issue. Now we do throw down a Mimic Beacon, and we put our zombie buddies in front of the bad guys, so we're doing everything we can to give him a fighting chance by keeping the enemies distracted as our Necromancers evac out. Now Atorius does have Mist, so if we can put enough distance between him and the bad guys, we can re-enter Concealment and he may survive. But once again, the game has other plans. It drops reinforcements right on top of him, so this makes breaking line of sight impossible. And Artorius, unfortunately, gets a closer look at the sector pod than anyone ever should, and it's the end of the line for him. And man oh man, did this annoy me. A sector pod and a gatekeeper. Like, really? I guess I should have paid closer attention to what the shadow chamber was telling me. But nothing can be done now. And losing Artorius really sucks, but it was at least a pretty epic way to go out. I mean, this guy literally sacrificed himself to save the entire world from the Avatar project. Good guy, Artorius. Then we have a Gorilla Op, and I get even more annoyed. We use a 97% rapid fire with Drifter to down this Spectre, and he misses one of the shots. This man is so good with scoring mind controls, but absolutely garbage when it comes to shooting. So I'm hoping Plot Armor can finish this thing off, but nope. It survives with 1 HP. The Brigadiers are really letting us down on this one. Now we do persevere, and we eventually take down the Gatekeeper that's on this mission, and this thing is the whole reason we came. Level 3 Psyamps, here we come. We do also need a Gatekeeper Wreck for level 3 staves, but I've honestly given up on those by now. It's taken us over 20 hours of gameplay just to get two Gatekeeper Wrecks, let alone getting any more. And I'm well and truly ready for this campaign to be over. However, we do have to wait just a little bit longer as the Barrier Dark Event has activated. Now this increases enemy psionic defense, which will make getting mind controls off much more difficult. And when I say much more difficult, as an example, instead of having a 90% chance to dominate an Archon, we now have a 0% chance. So yeah, it's quite the difficulty spike. We need to wait until this Dark Event has finished, as Dominate is going to be crucial for the final two missions. And honestly, having to wait isn't the worst thing ever. It gives us time to do more missions and level up some more Brigadiers. And by the time we're ready for the Network Tower, we have nine of them. So that should do us. Let's finish this thing. We get two really useful intel options for the Network Tower. We can send a fourth soldier, and the enemy's will is reduced by 50%. Now, Cat may not be a Brigadier, but she is a Colonel, so close enough. She's going to be really useful. And the will reduction means our Dominate chance is now 100% on pretty much every enemy. So your mind control success has two factors. Your soldier's psionic score, the higher that is, the better your chances, and also the enemy's will score, and the lower that is, the better your chances. So having that will reduction makes these aliens ours for the taking, and take them we do. So between four necromancers and three mind controlled A's, we have complete dominance on this one. 
and once we reach the final pod, I don't even really bother with them. We can just teleport straight past them, hack the objective, and claim the victory. Now I think without those two intel bonuses that we scored, this mission could have been quite tricky, but the RNG really came through for us here. So let's hope that can continue on the final mission. Somehow I don't think it's going to though. Here's the enemy list for the final mission, and you may notice there's a bit of a problem. Not a single advent soldier on this one. That means no zombies for us to raise. Now we could use mind control instead to get some extra firepower, but ideally I want to save the dominates for the final chamber. And the same thing with death touch, I don't want to use that until the final chamber as well. So this first part of the mission could get a bit dicey. And I'll also say here that just like our other solo class runs, we cannot use the commander's avatar on this one. Now what I've done to help us out is to give every single soldier the lightning ability. Between the whole team, one person should usually be in place to be able to land a useful lightning without having to move, and on the off chance that no one in the team can, I've also given everyone the vigor ability. This will mean we can give a lot of extra actions to people if we need to relocate to use lightning, or if we just need extra actions for any other reason. It gives us a lot of flexibility. My plan initially was to place one person into concealment, scout ahead with them and drop a lightning on the pod from concealment, at which point the rest of the crew would be able to teleport in and cause some carnage. The strat doesn't seem to work all that well though, as the pods just keep patrolling, and that makes hitting with lightning quite difficult. Like I said earlier, aiming with this ability can be difficult, especially when you can't move at the same time. But even if we can't hit the entire pod with lightning, it is still a useful ability to have. Like here, where we can disable the heavy mechs with one lightning, we can then use a second one on the sector pod to shut that down too. And then it's just a matter of cleaning up the mutons this turn, which is very easy to do with fireball and combustion. And fireball seems to do more damage based on which level of staff we're using, so the guys with the level 2 staves can often actually one-shot a muton with a single fireball. It's pretty great, I gotta admit. I've also given Drifter and Deathwish blue screen rounds, so the remaining mechanical enemies are easily destroyed on the next turn. And even if we couldn't take them out, we could use Vigor and Lightning as needed to shut them down for another turn, and then we could take them out that way. Now I did use Astral Projection earlier to scout the location of the enemy pods, and once I used this ability, the enemy turn started taking much longer than usual, so I kind of wish I hadn't, but whatever, we can't change it now. The good news though is that we can use basically a leapfrog teleport strategy to cover ground really quickly. We know where the pods are, so we can avoid them while teleporting our way through the level to move really fast. Unless, of course, there's a pod of mechs waiting for us. See, robotic enemies aren't revealed by astral projection, it only works on living units. So I've stuffed up quite royally on this one. And I decide in response to this, we're just going to teleport away. See, we can teleport to any tile that the team has line of sight on, so it's easy to fall back out of range of the mechs. I leave Salty on the front line since he's concealed and he can scout the location of these Robo Boys for us. And you can see here just how broken their AI is. It's something to do with us having a unit concealed and them not having line of sight on any of our team. They just get confused and start running around in a circle, and the best part is they cluster really close together while they do it. This leaves them incredibly vulnerable to a lightning which Salty happily delivers. And then, just like vultures flocking to some roadkill, our necromancers can teleport in and the beatdown is quickly delivered. So while that strat was completely unintentional, it actually worked really well. I do decide we'll be a bit more careful as we proceed, however, and I send Bismarck first, who has been put into concealment. And just so you know, teleporting does break concealment. That's why we're just moving normally with our concealed units. And once again, we have a whole pot of mechs, and this one's even bigger than the last. It's almost like the game deliberately threw robotic enemies at me, thinking this was a weakness for our necromancers. 
But between lightning, teleport, blue screen rounds, and using vigor to take multiple blue screen round shots in a single turn, these things aren't actually a challenge for us at all. So bad luck game, you're gonna have to try better than that. So how about some berserkers? Well, we can actually land a fireball from beyond line of sight. So this means that the pod doesn't activate since they can't see us. Now we can only hit one of the berserkers, but that one starts slowly burning to death while we remain perfectly safe. And by the time the pod does activate, it has basically no health left. And the remaining berserker on its own is easy pickings for our magical boys. Then we can use lightning to kick things off with the double gatekeeper pod. One of the codexes did avoid the blast though, so I'm hoping Drifter can one-shot it with blue screen rounds, but it just holds on, and very intelligently, it teleports over to a second pod with some Archons. And so in going after this thing, I end up activating the Archons. So well played, Codex. That was actually a really smart maneuver by the game there. Now I focus fire on one of the Archons to take it out, along with the Codex, and I'm hoping the second one will just go for Blazing Pinions, which we can easily handle. However, I made a miscalculation here. See, Codexes, for whatever reason, tend to get stunned for zero actions. Now this can be a good thing, as it does stop them from cloning when you attack them if they're stunned, but we have a bigger issue in that the Codex that we hit with Lightning does still get to act on its turn, and it blasts us with a psionic bomb as you would expect it to. Now feedback does end the codex, so that's good, but now a whole bunch of our staves are jammed, so our options next turn are going to be quite limited. The remaining Archon decides it's going to give us a break, given this bad news, and it doesn't attack us at all, it just randomly runs around, or flies around. So that's even better than Blazing Pinions. Now I do have a solution for our jammed staves problem here. By spamming Vigor, we can give a couple of our troops enough actions to teleport, reload their staves, and hit a lightning to stun the bad guys all over again. Yeah, Vigor works even when the staff is jammed, it uses the Siam, so that's really good for us. On the next turn, Drifter is up to his old tricks, missing an 82% shot, and this is quite bad, it means that we cannot eliminate the final gatekeeper. I could have used Eldritch Storm on it, but I wasn't sure that it would inflict enough damage for the kill. So instead I use a Mimic Beacon to distract the big metal egg. And I was really annoyed at having to use this here, I wanted to save all my consumables for the final section, but what can I say, Drifter is gonna Drifter. So anyway, with an extra turn, we can easily dispose of the Gatekeeper and the other Archon which was still stunned, and now let's go wrap this one up one way or another. Now just like in the Chosen Strongholds, I start off by using Bone Armor on everyone, and I did consider letting Bone Armor come off cooldown and use it on everyone twice, just to give us even more armor, but I'm way too impatient for that, so we're just going in. And I don't bother with concealment here, and instead we just teleport in, we can easily dominate the two Archons, adding them to our ranks. And this is going to be key here. The more enemies we can mind control, the less likely we are to get overwhelmed by all the reinforcements that are going to come in. Now as for the Avatar, well like I said earlier, I was saving Death Touch for this part of the mission. And one-shotting the ultimate bad guy is just as satisfying now as it was last time. In fact, it's even more satisfying because it doesn't cause us to lose one of our best soldiers. So just like that, we are in full control of the chamber now. There's no enemies here. At least until the reinforcements come in, and we've got some codexes and some vipers. We mind control one codex and two vipers, and we eliminate the rest of the enemies. And here, we don't really care about the types of enemies we're dominating. Even if they're not the best units to have, just having as many soldiers as possible gives us a huge advantage. It gives us more firepower, and equally as importantly, it gives Advent much less firepower. So Avatar number 2 warps in, and you can probably guess what we do in response. Yeah, it's another Death Touch, and this one's down for the count as well. And our whole team has Death Touch for the record, so we're not going to run out of them anytime soon. And a great thing about these Necromancers is Teleport. Even when all the enemies spawn on one side of the map, like they have this turn, it's no big deal. We can just teleport to wherever they are and bring the mayhem. So Advent are honestly pretty helpless against us here. 
And we also managed to add a Berserker to our ranks this turn, so that's very nice. Then on the next turn, all the reinforcements drop in on the other side of the map. So we're going to have to teleport over there now. But again, it's not a big deal. Now a pot of priests and a pot of chrysalids this time. These guys could cause some problems for us, but we've only got one avatar left to deal with. So it's probably too little too late for advent to be honest. We teleport in once more and we start dropping some fireballs. In one of the priests, we actually disable with the Viper's Tongue Pull. Now, this is a great way to shut the priest down. It's not going to be able to do anything. And we're also able to avoid its really annoying sustain ability. Two of the priests do survive thanks to said sustain ability. And one of them does put Rich into stasis, which is kind of bad because it breaks our mind control on the codex. But like I said already, it really is too little too late. The final avatar spawns in, and as long as we have a single soldier with death touch available, which we do, we've got plenty of them, it's game over for advent. This ability is just ridiculously powerful. So we send in Bismarck, and we achieve victory. We've beaten XCOM 2 using only Necromancers. And what can I say about this one? I went into this thinking it was going to be a fun little gimmick run for Halloween, and yet it turned out to be almost as much of a slog as the secondaries only run was. The early game was really easy, the Lost World Dark Event carried us through the mid game, the late game was pretty tough, and the final mission returned to being easy. So we came full circle in a way. This was a crazy run. But I guess that's going to be part of the fun of using these modded classes that I'm not familiar with. Each run is going to be a surprise, and I'm honestly good with that. It's going to keep things interesting. So that's all from me. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please consider doing the usual things of liking, commenting, and subscribing. It does really help the channel grow. So happy Halloween, and I'll see you next time.